Well, good morning, Neighborhood Church. Welcome to the first live service of 2022. How are you doing today? I got to tell you, I really like that intro music. It's rocking. I kind of feel like a professional wrestler in the 80s, like coming out. I think I'll talk to Force. We'll get like some pyrotechnics, like maybe they can announce. And now, 180 pounds in the red corner. Anyways, I'm sorry. It's good to see you all. And we're going to be starting off a new series today called Fixing What's Broken, A Beginner's Guide to Repairing Broken Relationships. Now, before we dive in, I want to tell you a story. When I was growing up, I had a lot of friends whose families had a business, a, a family business. I had one friend whose dad was a pharmacist and owned a pharmacy. Uh, I had another friend whose uh, grandparents had a hops farm in Montana that was passed down generation to generation. You know, there were law practices, hardware stores, production studios, all these different family businesses. But my favorite by far was this girl I met in high school. Her name was Alyssa, and she was cousins with my friend, and her family owned a pizza parlor. Pizza was the family business, and I can tell you from personal experience, business was good. It was really good. And I mean, how could it not be? Everybody loves pizza. I mean, unless you're lactose intolerant, and then you get a pass, because I think crippling indigestion is a worthwhile excuse. But still, I'll do respect to the vegans in the room, or maybe the health-conscious people. I've got to say, I love pizza. Uh, for me, pizza is less of a food, more of a lifestyle, as you can probably tell by looking at my dad bod up here today. And uh, my wife is Italian, so really, what kind of husband would I be if I didn't honor her heritage every single day by consuming vast amounts of pizza? In fact, I love pizza so much that I bought this stupid shirt online a few years back. Death by pizza. Folks, that is how I want to go out. And if I don't slow down with the pizza, it's probably how I'm going to go out sooner than later. Anyways, my friends, their parents owned a pizza joint. And this was the coolest family business I had ever experienced. You can probably picture what it looks like in your head. Just that classic pizza parlor with the wood paneled walls from the 1970s, the brown carpet, the formica tables that are chipped on the edges with a ton of gum on the bottom of them. It was like stepping onto the set of that 70s show. And on top of that, there was an arcade in the back of the pizza parlor. Old school games like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, not to mention a row of fully functional pinball machines. I was 15 or 16, this was the early to mid 2000s, and this place was like my personal Xanadu. So, it came as a bit of a shock when I found out that this friend Alyssa had no interest whatsoever in inheriting the family business. This was shocking. And as an adult, I understand that restaurant management is, is difficult. But when I was 16, I was like, how could you not want to inherit this pizza parlor? How could you not enter this business of free pizza and arcade games for the rest of your life? It seemed so glamorous at the time. I eventually lost track of these friends. Um, and I think not soon after, their family sold the pizza parlor, sold it off, walked away from it entirely. And as much as I still love pizza, as an adult, I can understand why this friend didn't want to inherit the family business. Restaurant management isn't super glamorous. It's hard. It's really hard, actually. There's tons of overhead. There are strict regulations. You've got competition all over town. And for many, it, it's a lot of effort with very little payoff. So my friends didn't want to inherit the family business. Maybe you've met someone like that or at least seen it in TV shows or movies, it's, it's kind of a thing, right? The, the kids whose, whose parents or grandparents hope they will take the baton and continue the family business, and yet they say, no thank you, not for me. In fact, I was doing some research this week, and I read in the Harvard Business Review a study that claimed that 70% of family-owned businesses fail or are sold before the second generation gets a chance to take over. We can see the numbers show us that for the most part, people are not excited about inheriting the family business. Well, why am I talking about this this morning? Well, as I said, we're starting a series today called Fixing What's Broken, A Beginner's Guide to Repairing Broken Relationships. And this month, we're going to be talking about the tragedy of broken relationships, which are really the foundation of so much suffering and misery in our world today. Broken marriages, broken families, broken friendships, all of it. So this month we want to look to Jesus for insight 
on how to repair these relationships. We want to look to Jesus for practical steps on how to put the pieces back together. So, again, why am I kicking off this relationship series with the long-winded story about pizza and arcade games and family businesses? Well, it's a bit of a metaphor. Let me explain. When we make the decision to place our faith in Jesus, when we decide to follow him and make his ways our ways, the authors of the New Testament in the Bible say it's like being adopted into a brand new family, family of God. This diverse family of people from all across the world, all throughout history, united together in Jesus. When we embrace Jesus as our Savior, as God's ambassador towards humanity, we become a part of this new family. And this family has a business. The church, uh, Christians, God's people, however you want to label us, we have a family business, and it's not pizza and arcade games. It's, it's not construction. It's not a flower shop down the road. It's reconciliation. For followers of Jesus, reconciliation is the family business. Reconciliation, to put it very simply, is, is just the business of repairing broken relationships. It's relational repair. It's peacemaking. It's taking what's broken and making it beautiful again. It's bringing the hope of restoration to even the most hopeless situations. Reconciliation is our family business. It's central to our faith in Jesus. It's not just a part of our faith, really. It, it's the heart of our faith. It's not a fringe benefit or a religious side hustle we do uh, when we're not in church together. It's the very center of our faith, and it's actually the very identity of God himself. God is love. And that love is expressed through a powerful, never-ending desire for restoration that results in reconciliation for us individually, with God, with each other, corporately as a community, and, and even cosmically. Reconciliation is the heart of God, which is put perfectly on display in the person, work, and life of Jesus Christ. Jesus, as we say, is the living breathing, walking, talking embodiment of God's divine presence. He's the one who makes all things new. He's the catalyst for God's restoration and reconciliation for your life, marriage, family, your world, and our entire universe. There's a guy named Paul. He was a leader in the early Christian church. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. And here's what he said about Jesus. He said, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So all the love of God, all the light of God, all the wisdom, all the righteousness, all the, all the justice, all of it dwells in the person of Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus brings reconciliation for all things. And not just people, not just individuals, not just relationships, but actually the literal physical and natural order of our entire universe. We live in a broken world. You know this. Just look at the news any given morning. But also on top of that, uh, science tells us that our entire universe is in what's called a state of entropy, which means our universe is slowly but surely winding itself down and degrading over time. But then here comes Jesus, God's perfect representative to humanity to make all things new. This means we know, we believe that one day, no matter what happens, Jesus will return, the dead will be raised, and the universe will be completely renewed forever and ever, which means no more brokenness, no more pain, no more sickness, no more injustice, none of it. That's the hope that we have. And you might be here this morning, and you're new to the Jesus thing, or, you know, just kind of skeptical, and you might be thinking, well, Jordan, that sounds a little fantastical to me. I'm not sure if I believe that. It sounds a little weird. I mean, honestly, yeah, it does sound weird, but this is what we believe, this scandalous idea that Jesus is coming to make all things new. This is the essence of our faith, restoration that is rooted in reconciliation of all things in Jesus Christ. That's true for you. It's true for me, our community, our world, and our entire universe. That's what the Christian faith is all about. 
But here the thi- uh, here's the thing, as we say over and over, um, it starts now. It's not just something we look forward to in the future. It's something we participate in in the present. Jesus has invited us while we're here not to just twiddle our thumbs and, and wait for him to come back, but to get involved, to get started right now building God's kingdom here on earth. We have inherited this family business of reconciliation, and now Jesus says it's time to get to work. That's why at Neighborhood, one of our core values that we like to share is reconciliation is the center of our work. Reconciliation is is what we do, and it's why we do what we do. When we open the doors of Neighborhood Church to our community in a spirit of love and inclusion, that's reconciliation. When we share uh, and model the way of Jesus here in Visalia, that's inclusion. When we link arms with our community partners to make life better for those in need, like Shelly was talking about on the video today with these monthly four projects, that's the work of reconciliation. Even when we throw big parties in our parking lot with with food trucks and things like S'more Visalia with bounce houses and we have 4,000 people here and we invite the entire community, that's the work of reconciliation. Reconciliation is the family business here at Neighborhood Church and across the entire family of Jesus all over the world. This week in the news, a few weeks ago actually, the world honored the life and legacy of the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who passed away at the age of 90. Now, a lot of you might not know this guy, but Desmond Tutu was a South African bishop in the Anglican Church, which is just a denomination of Christianity. He was a leading voice for the cause of reconciliation. He was an instrumental figure in the ending of segregation in South Africa, which was called apartheid. It eventually won him a Nobel Peace Prize, and he's written all sorts of books about peacemaking and loving your enemies and and nonviolence and the way of Jesus. And in his life, faith, and work, Desmond Tutu really expressed his understanding that reconciliation is the family business for God's people. It's a very real invitation and obligation for those of us who call Jesus Lord. Here's something he once wrote before he passed away. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not just ethereal, spiritual, otherworldly activities. They have to do with the real world. They are real. Because in a very real sense, without forgiveness, there is no future. This month we're talking about forgiveness. This month we're talking about restoration, repairing what's broken. Not just this nice, fluffy Christian idea on Sunday morning when we sing Kumbaya and go out of here and uh, bash each other over our head. We're talking the real, radical discipline, something that Jesus' people are called to do. And I think it's easy for me to stand up here and talk about reconciliation and love. Um, It's easy to make a social media post, or or it's easy to say, well, I believe in love, or I believe in reconciliation. But it's so much harder for us to live this out. And if we can be honest for a moment, we don't do that great of a job a lot of the time. We've inherited this family business of reconciliation from Jesus, and um, the windows are busted out. There's rats in the basement. The utilities are about to be shut off. Rent is overdue. We're running the business of reconciliation into the ground sometimes. And here's why. Let's just be real. Authenticity is a core value here. So many times in the Christian church, we're supposed to be the stronghold of reconciliation and peacemaking and love for neighbors. But many times in our culture, you've probably seen this, faith becomes weaponized. Reconciliation just devolves into religion. And our faith is used not as a uh, channel for reconciliation, but as a tool to judge others, to belittle our enemies, to attack people, and and really isolate ourselves from our world. Our faith goes from being love and serve to divide and conquer. Uh, And it's really sad. We can't afford to run the family business in the ground. We can't abandon our sacred roots of reconciliation, especially, especially in today's crazy, crazy culture that we live in. Division, divorce, culture wars, political parties, ideological opposition, school board meeting brawls, corporate walkouts, church splits, cancel culture, 
Twitter feeds, friends ghosting friends, parents and children not speaking to each other for years. This is the reality we live in, especially in this pandemic era of the past few years, which honestly has felt like a, a gallon of gasoline tossed on top of a raging dumpster fire. I mean, in the past few years, I've seen friends become enemies. I've seen families split. I've seen marriages crash and burn, and I'm sure you have too. In fact, maybe some of you are experiencing that today. I want to ask you a, a question, actually. Uh, it's a rhetorical question. Don't shout out your answer. Just think about it quietly for a second. But since 2020, since all this pandemic stuff has kicked off, ask yourself this. What have I lost? Or more importantly, who have I lost? Since 2020, who have I lost? What relationships have you lost in the past couple of years? What friendships fell apart? Some of you here today, um, you ended friendships um, over debates about COVID. Um, you didn't see eye to eye on masks or vaccines or shutdowns or any of it. Um, some people, uh, some of you may be here today, you have family relationships that are strained because of the last election. I have friends who haven't spoken to their immediate family members in months, if not years, uh, because of political hostilities. Like, you know, this party's all about Biden, this party's all about Trump, this party's all about whatever. They take their political affiliations and they use it as an excuse to divide friendships and families. That's not all right. How about racial issues? How about conversations about policing the past few years? Um, debates about what's being taught in public schools? The whole conversation about gender identity and sexual orientation. What relationships have you walked away from in the past few years because of these hot-button, divided topics? Now, I'm not up here tut-tutting or wag wagging my finger at you. I, like you, have my opinions on all these things. I'm not saying we as Christians don't, <laughs> we're not able to have opinions. We just have to agree with everybody. I'm not standing here saying these aren't important conversations or there's not room for healthy debate in our relationships. In fact, we need healthy debate if our relationships are going to survive. I'm not saying we live in a world where everyone can be right about everything and that we should all go out of here and just live our truth and not talk about the hard stuff. Yes, we've got to have hard conversations. Absolutely. We've got to hold to our convictions. But no, we can't do so in a way that just is a wrecking ball to our relationships. We can't have conversations and divisions that just destroy our families, our friendships, things that cause us to just ghost the loved ones in our lives, to cancel our friends, and to write off our neighbors and our community. 2022, we're only like nine days in, and it's just as crazy as it's ever been. But neighborhood, I think we're challenged to do better. As people who have made the conscious decision to follow Jesus and make his ways our ways, we have an invitation. Well, it's not an invitation. It's more of an obligation to be peacemakers, to love others, even if we disagree with them, to treat them with the basic honor and dignity they deserve as people made in the image of God. Jesus would say, you know, you should go so far as to love your enemies, Here's that most famous quote from Jesus that's so easy to understand but, but so hard to live out. Jesus said this, You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Another question. Who are your enemies? Think about it. Who is the person you despise the most? Don't shout their name out, please. Who is it? Who's driving you crazy? Jesus says, love them. It's crazy, right? Love your enemies. It's one of the hardest things for us to wrap our heads around. And so obviously, if we're supposed to love our enemies, we should love those we just disagree with, right? Not everyone we disagree with is our enemy, so if we're supposed to love our enemies, obviously we should love them too. Doesn't mean we're going to be best friends. Doesn't mean we're going to be riding a tandem bike together down Main Street. It just means honor, love, and respect. Now, I think the more I study our faith, the more I get into the scriptures and, and think about Jesus, there is a lot of mystery 
in the Christian faith. There's a lot of room for theological debate and speculation, but I think one thing is crystal clear for Jesus' people, and that's that reconciliation is not an option. It's not optional for Jesus' people. It's an invitation and obligation for those of us who call Jesus Lord. And we've all got a lot of work to do. I know I certainly do. We've all got brokenness in our relationships. And that's why we're starting the new year with this series, A Beginner's Guide to Fixing Broken Relationships. Over the next few weeks, Force is going to be unpacking these, these practical ways that we can do the work of reconciliation in our lives. Um, a work that the Apostle Paul once referred to as the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus has given his people. What does reconciliation look like for marriages that are about to implode? What does reconciliation look like for friendships that are on the rocks? What does it look like for families that are estranged? What does it look like for communities, for our city, for our world? Those are the things we're going to be talking about all month long. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking today, um, Jordan, you don't know my story. You can stand up there and, and talk about peacemaking and love and, and all that, and that's great. But you don't know my story. You don't see my relationship. You don't see how my marriage is falling apart. You don't see the hurt and the betrayal, the bitterness. You don't know my story. You can't see that it's too far gone. And it's true. I don't know your guys' stories. And it's true. A lot of us have very messy relationships and situations going on even right now. So I don't know your story, but I do know this. Because of the reconciliation and transformation we can find in Jesus, I've seen marriages come back from adultery and infidelity stronger than ever before. Because of Jesus, I've seen enemies become friends. I've seen families reunited after years of estrangement, bitterness, and division. I've seen prodigal sons and daughters come home, all because of this hope we have in Jesus. So yes, let me be the first to say, your relationship might be in a bad spot. Yes, it probably seems hopeless right now. No, it's not going to be easy to fix it. But reconciliation is not impossible. It's going to be hard, but it's not impossible. Have any of you ever watched those home renovation shows on like TLC and HGTV? They're super popular. You know, people love shows like uh, um, Fixer Upper or This Old House, Trading Spaces, Extreme Home Makeover Edition, you know, Move That Bus. That one, you guys know what I'm talking about? People love these shows. You see these busted, dilapidated, outdated old houses that are crumbling and falling apart, and you think, wow, there's no way they're fixing that thing up. But then here comes our heroes. I can see Ty Pennington's beautiful smiling face right up there on the screen. The Ty Penningtons, the Bob Vilas, the, the Property Brothers, all these people who come and, and restore and renovate these homes with incredible skill and artistry. They take the ugliness and the brokenness and they turn these homes into something far more beautiful the owners could have ever imagined. And we love these shows. They're very popular. And I think it's because deep down as human beings, we love the idea that beauty can come from brokenness. And that's really the hope of the Christian faith, right? That just like these master craftsmen and women and, and artists, they can come in and, and turn these broken homes into something beautiful. It's the hope that God can restore our lives and our relationships, no matter how messy they are. With hard work and, and perseverance, even the most ramshackle house, can become a beautiful home. And I think the same can be said for our broken relationships. And that's our hope and our prayer for you in 2022. But here's the thing. As I just said, reconciliation isn't easy. It takes hard work. It takes commitment. And most of all, it takes love. Not just lovey-dovey flowers and chocolates, love, but real self-sacrificing love. The type of love we see God expressing through Jesus. Going back to Desmond Tutu, who I mentioned earlier, he wrote this about the hard work of reconciliation. 
He said, forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones, it's, it's not about pretending that things are other than they are. It's not about patting one another on the back and turning a blind eye to the wrong. True reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It's a risky undertaking, but in the end, it's worthwhile. Because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. We're talking about honesty. We're talking about vulnerability. We're talking about humility. These are the tools we need to repair our broken relationships. But none of these things come easy. This family business of ours, it's messy. It takes blood, sweat, and tears. But it's the work we've been given. So whether you're here today and your relationships are great, or they're going down the tubes, or they're building a home on rock bottom, Wherever you're at today, we hope this series is going to be helpful for you. And as I mentioned, over the next few weeks, Force is going to be unpacking these practical tips um, about repairing broken relationships. So today, as we finish up the rest of our time, I just want to keep things super simple. I think when it comes to doing the work of reconciliation, I think when we're repairing um, our friendships, our marriages, our families, our communities, it can seem daunting especially if things are particularly dysfunctional. So the question you might ask is, well, where do I even begin? How do I get started? What's the first step? And I think the answer is actually really easy. You probably know it already, but it's one of those things that's easy to understand and difficult to master. Reconciliation starts with love. It starts with love. Again, the Apostle Paul, an early leader in the Christian church who wrote a lot of the New Testament, um, he was a leader in the first century. And let me just tell you, the early Christians, uh, it was messy. <laughs> there were divisions just like today. There were racial tensions. There were culture wars. There were religious disputes. There was political infighting. It wasn't too different to some of the issues we see in the church today. And so Paul traveled around, and he wrote these letters that we now have in the New Testament, and he's encouraging the earliest Christians He's telling them, hey, guys, uh, if you're going to love Jesus, you need to live like Jesus. Loving Jesus means living like Jesus, which means loving our neighbors. It means honoring one another. It means caring for our families. It means seeking peace in our world. Jesus had come, unveiled God's kingdom, performed these amazing miracles, taught us to love our neighbors. And then he goes up to heaven. The church starts, and pretty much right off the bat, people are bashing each other over the head. So throughout his teaching, Paul wanted the earliest Christians to know that reconciliation is the family business for God's people. Now, I touched on this earlier. I want to bring it back around. Look what Paul wrote to the early church. He said this, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. To God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. He has given us this family business to inherit. Now, if you don't understand any of that, uh, Jesus had a friend named John who I think wrote it very simply in what is one of my favorite scriptures of all time. Here it is. John said, We love because he first loved us. That's the whole Christian faith in one sentence. That's the family business. We love because he first loved us. Jesus came, and through his life, death, and resurrection, brought us reconciliation with God. It's a vertical reconciliation that we then embrace in faith and then plays out horizontally. We love because he loved us. I actually got a little diagram for you. Vertical reconciliation that is expressed through horizontal reconciliation. In this love, it's not just a feeling. It's not just an emotional high, a tingle up your spine, butterflies in your stomach. Quite simply, at its root, love is when you want more for the other person than you want for yourself. It's when you place the needs of someone else above your own, your spouse, your children, your friends, your loved ones, whoever. That's what love looks like. 
So when it comes to reconciliation, this is important. Love is the first step, but don't forget this. Love always takes the first step. Does that mean? Well, I mean, it's easy to make excuses. It's easy to say things like, yeah, I'm cool if you're cool. They can call me. I'll apologize if you apologize. If they reach out to me first, they have my number. They can pick up the phone. They know where I live. They can get this process started. I had a friend who had, had, you know, was experiencing a broken relationship with one of his best friends, and he told me, like, well, he really has to pursue me. Otherwise, I'm not going to forgive him. What? That's not what the love we find in Jesus looks like. True love takes the first step. Think about God. He didn't sit back and wait for us to call him or to pursue him. In fact, he did the opposite. He laid it all out on the line. He pursued us first. He took the first step. He loved us when we didn't deserve it. That's what true love looks like. It's the love that we've been invited and obligated really to embrace and express in our relationships. Love always takes the first step. It makes the first move. It doesn't sit around and, and wait for the perfect moment. Guys, the perfect moment is never going to come. Love springs into action and carries out the work of reconciliation without hesitation. So neighborhood, as we head into this series this month, as we're talking about repairing the brokenness in our relationships, I want to ask you, rather I want you to ask yourselves this week or this afternoon even, what's the first step? If we're called to be reconcilers, and if reconciliation starts with love, and if love always takes the first step, the question you should be asking yourself is, what is that first step I need to be taking? This week, when you walk out of here today even, who's that person you need to call? Who's that person you need to text today? Who do you need to apologize to? Who do you need to forgive? What's the first step towards reconciliation? What does love require you to do in your situation? How can all of us be initiators for restoration? We can't wait any longer. Because this is who we are. It's who we are, and it's, it's what we do. We're peacemakers. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. We're reconcilers. We love because he first loved us. Paul would also once write this to the early church. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Could you imagine how our community would change if we took this seriously? Could you imagine how our relationships would be transformed? This is who we are, guys. Not everyone here wants to inherit a barbershop one day or a pizza parlor or a funeral home. But in Jesus, all of us collectively have inherited a family business that requires our devotion for people who call Jesus Lord, follow Jesus, reconciliation is not an option. It's who we are and it's what we do. So today as we wrap up, before I pray, I want to invite you to our next NC Lab. Now, if you haven't been to an NC lab before, these are these kind of monthly rhythms we do. We create these highly interactive environments where we come together and we explore what we're talking about in depth. And we ask big questions and, and we wrestle with it. We've done a few so far and they've been absolutely fantastic. And so this month, Force is going to be leading a lab. I'm going to throw it on the screen for you here. It's going to be leading a lab called Why Don't They Get It? Conversation about repairing relationships by overcoming bias. Listen, if you're here today and you're like, I admit it, Jordan, I've lost friends, I've lost family members since 2020, I'm experiencing brokenness in my relationships, but, but I want to build bridges. But I want to be a reconciler. I want to take the first step. I want to be an initiator for restoration. If that's you, come sign up for this lab and let's 
talk about it. Force is going to be leading this on Tuesday, January 25th. Um, and here's the thing. It would be easy to reconcile if we could just change everybody with a snap of the finger, right? If everyone thought like us and, <laughs> and just believed the things we thought, but that's not reality, right? Reconciliation starts with us. Love takes the first step. So in this lab, we're going to be examining our own biases, our own pride. We're going to examine what it looks like to do the hard work of taking the first step in reconciling our relationships. So we want to invite you to come out. If that sounds good, if you want to get authentic with others and be a reconciler, come see us at the next lounge after service today. You can sign up on a card there or online this week, and that's going to be a fantastic time. We hope you'll get signed up. Let's pray this morning. God, we are nine days into a new year, and we thank you for this new chapter, this new season. And we ask, like every year before this, would you just be with us? Would you lead us and guide us? Would you fill our hearts with your grace and love and peace? Would you transform the brokenness that's within us? And then may we take that and um, restore the brokenness in our relationships in our workplaces, in our cities, in our community. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to be problem solvers. Help us to be humble. Help us to be willing to take that first step to be initiators of restoration. I pray for every single person in the room today. Lord, you see their relationships. You see that some are on the rocks. Some are barely hanging on. Lord, we believe that you are the God of healing and hope, and no relationship is too far gone for you. So would you please be with us this month as we learn how to repair these broken relationships? And lastly, we want to do a special prayer today for all our kids who are going back to school this week. Again, Lord, it's only nine days into 2022, and things are just as crazy as ever. So would you be with our children? Would you protect them with all the COVID stuff? But would you also protect them from this cynical world we live in, Lord? Protect their joy, protect their peace, and help us to be the community, parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents that we need to be. We love you so, so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Jordan, for kicking off the series for us today. Yeah, you can give him a hand. Definitely. Hey, neighborhood, just a couple of reminders before we are out of here. First thing, our prayer team is going to be down to the right of the stage. If you're here and would like some prayer, we'd love to pray with you today. Also, if you'd like to be a part of giving to the mission, you can do that via the drop boxes on your way out. And if you are new with us today, we'd love to say hello to you. Um, head out to the next lounge on the patio. We'd love to um, give you a discover and see box. And last thing, before you leave, um, we are partnering with the Creative Center this month and collecting art supplies for them. And be sure to check out, you might have seen on your way in all the cool art that's on the back walls. Those are all done by the clients of the Creative Center. They're just doing incredible stuff. Stuff. We're excited to partner with them. Mike is here from the Creative Center hanging out in the back. So if you have questions, you can talk to him. But have a wonderful week and we will see you next Sunday.